It's Car Kicks. Classics, custom sports cars and trucks, plus news, great places to go, and products you'll love. Don't forget to check us out on the web at carkicks.com. That's K A R K I X.com and on Facebook and Twitter. Now, here's the host of Car Kicks, Bob Lang. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Car Kicks. This is our special Corvette edition. Today we're going to meet one of the biggest Corvette restoration parts dealers in the United States and take a ride in a Chevrolet 100th Anniversary Edition Corvette. But let's start out with the history of the Corvette right now. It may be hard to imagine if your experience with GM is only from the last few years of reducing brands that have been around for generations, like Oldsmobile and Pontiac, and going into debt to the American taxpayer. But General Motors was once the biggest corporation in the world. Standard Oil, now ExxonMobil, was second at about half the size. It wasn't until the early 50s that GM began to notice sports cars were something they might try, and it was Harley Earl, the designer of so many epic cars, that planted the seed that would become Corvette. Earl handed the project to Robert McLean, who used the extensive GM parts bin to work towards the first GM sports car. The parts were mostly sedan. With a strong attempt to keep things balanced, they were pretty close with a 5347 weight distribution for the first model. They chose the 150 horsepower 6 with three side draft carburetors. They chose the two-speed automatic of the day because they thought no four-speed could handle the power. My, how things would change. The goal was an open two-seater for about the same cost as a sedan, which back then was about $1,800 to $2,000 US. Fiberglass would help them do it its tooling costs were less than steel. They'd be bringing the car to the GM Motorama exhibit at the New York Auto Show. The McLean team would continue to focus on making the car feasible and affordable. Good thing too, because when Ed Cole, a newly minted chief engineer, saw it, he surely had the vision to bring it to market. While the Corvette name can be traced back to early French steam vessels, the World War II name is generally considered the route for the car, a small, light, maneuverable warship. Fits the car to a T. Who named it? Ed Cole had managers researching names when Myron Scott, an assistant manager in the advertising department, and Soapbox Derby founder suggested Corvette, and Cole absolutely loved it. So did the public at the GM Motorama. Demand would push the prototype to production in just six months. And it would be in the house that Billy Duran built, the factory in Flint, Michigan. The Corvette was born on June 30, 1953. Whisking the car into production would not give much time for preening. Although the car looked great, it was a parts bin special. Not much of a sports car, really. Today, there are motorcycles with more horsepower than the first Corvette. They may have wanted a sports car that costs like a sedan, but want and get are sometimes separated by an ocean of money. At $3,500, the Corvette wasn't cheap, but it was exclusive. Only 300 Polo White Corvettes were made before the 54 model came out. The 54 added a few colors and that's it. It made 10 times as many though and moved the assembly to St. Louis. With all the excitement and rush to get to market, the fact that the Corvette looked better than it performed was proving problematic as the 54s were sitting on dealer lots for months. Corvette needed to perform as good as it looked and the Blue Flame 6 was not going to do it. Good thing Ed Cole was working on a motor that would become iconic in American motoring, the Chevy small block. This motor would affect the fate of the whole motor company, but it would save the Corvette. The 265 cubic inch small block V8 was 195 horsepower in 1955, but until it got into vets on the dealer lots, production couldn't ramp up. As a result, only 700 1955 Corvettes were produced. But even with the 55 vet saddled with a two-speed automatic, it managed a zero to 60 time of eight and a half seconds. The potential of this new car was becoming more obvious. If you can find a 55 Corvette with a Blue Flame 6, it's very, very rare. The dawn of the Corvette was breaking into full sunlight with the 1956 model, the year that the Corvette would bring its own version of shock and awe. A new design, with what's been described as a toothy chrome grille and scooped sides, is considered by many to be the most beautiful of the classic Corvettes. The beauty wasn't just skin deep either, and the 265 was bumped to 210 horsepower. The 1956 Corvette was given another critical feature, in the naming of a chief engineer for the model, a man with a strange name 
and fiercely loyal to what was now his car. Zora Arkas Duntov, Belgian-American with Russian heritage. Zora joined GM after seeing the Motorama that launched the Corvette in 1953. He was a brilliant and vocal engineer and a performance driver, taking a Corvette up Pike's Peak to prove the power of the new small block to running 150 miles an hour in a 56 vet on the Daytona Beach Flying Mile. When you hear the words Grand Sport and Corvette together, think of Zora Arcus Duntoff. He loved the Corvette. He worked to make the Corvette faster and a better racer racing past the Thunderbirds 135 mile an hour top speed to reach 137.8. The ante would continue to be raised in 57 with the new and iconic 283 V8 and the T10 4-speed. Dual quads and even mechanical fuel injection kept the Corvette moving up. A 57 Fuely would launch to 60 in just 5.7 seconds. Today, that's still a great time. Of the 7,300 Corvettes built in 1957, only a thousand had fuel injection. Remember, this is an American sports car, so anything worth doing is worth doing more. The 1958 Corvette was surely a sign of growth as it grew two more headlights, a few pounds of chrome trim, and a grab bar to hold on for dear life. The 59 to 62 Corvettes were evolutionary with cleaner styling and more power. The 62 would get the 327 V8 and a return of the Fuley with 360 horsepower. Whatever you thought of GM or Chevy, the 1963 Corvette made you suck in air when you saw it up close, kind of like a Lambo Aventador does today. Stay tuned for the next installment of the History of the Corvette. And now Mark Roman on the road in Scottsdale. It's Mark Roman, and I'm sitting here with none other than the authority on Corvettes. If you've ever heard of Mid-American Motor Works, you've seen the catalog. He prints about four and a half million of those every year. It is Mike Yeager. Mike, what a pleasure. Hey, Mark. It's always a pleasure to be here at Barrett Jackson. I understand from talking with uh, Gary Bennett that uh, obviously we've got great weather, lots of cars, and even more people than normal. He said every industry they look at for Barrett Jackson is up this year, and I've got to tell you, when you saw the car going yesterday the prices they were bringing you know it's up it looks like the market's coming back and it's a great time to uh, buy a corvette isn't it every day 365 <laughs> days a year mark that's a load of questions it's always a great day to buy a corvette there's certainly a, a lot of corvettes for sale here and you know it's interesting just scrolling through a while ago looking at the cars that are for sale here how many c3 generation that's the 68 to 82 corvettes i think i've seen more of those on the auction block this year than i I've ever seen at Barrett Jackson. So I don't know if that's maybe a, uh, an early indicator of a trend because normally it's the solid axle cars. I mean, they all, they're here. There's a lot of them. The 63 to 67 with the 63 and the 67, the two bookends always being the hot movers, but a lot of C3 Corvettes. And that's interesting because that is a huge, huge market. Yeah, it, it really is. And I'm just impressed at the collection that's actually here. It looks like it's increased from last year. Everything is increased. I mean, you know, we see at Mid-America Motor Works that, you know, I think people are starting to span. People are stepping out a little bit. I think people get tired of not working on their cars, so to speak, and not buying parts. And this, you know, this is always a good bellwether of where our industry is headed. If Barrett Jackson is up and the other sales out here in the Scottsdale area are up, the whole year will be up. So these guys kick it off literally right at the first of the year. Oh, I got a little story to tell. I was uh, coming cross country from Pittsburgh. It was a foggy Saturday morning and I'm coming on I-70 and I see a billboard for a Corvette museum. It's called the My Garage Museum. And I, I turn in and I thought it was just going to be a tiny little place. And, oh, my gosh, I was overwhelmed. Now let's talk about my garage museum and what uh, all you have there. Well, you know, Mark, it's like every museum. I've got more cars than I have museum. That's the bad part. And when I look at the collection, my museum's a little different. A, it's who I am in the Corvette world and the stuff that I've collected over the years as, as being a hobbyist starting out with a 67 Corvette convertible. And I was a journeyman toolmaker. Really, I was an apprentice toolmaker 
Walker, and I bought my first Corvette when I was 20, and uh, pretty much the rest is history. I'm hooked on cars and car people and car events, and Corvette's been very, very good to me. And, you know, we also do the air-cooled Beetles, and people say, Volkswagen and Beetle, or Volkswagen and Corvette, two unrelated cars. But, you know, Mark, what I've learned is that uh, car people are car people. It really doesn't matter the brand. They're loyal to a brand, but they do the same things with their cars. You know, Corvette people, they they restore them, they collect them, they drag race them, they road race them. Uh, they put them in the garage and look at them. Well, Volkswagen Beetle people do the same thing. I mean, it's just, that's their brand. So my first car was a 62 Chevy. And when I got rid of it, I got a 66 Pontiac Le Mans. And when I got rid of that, I bought a Carmen Ghia. I went, I went back, backwards from the GN family, so to speak, but I traded that Ghia in on my 67 Corvette in 1970, and currently I own about 50 Corvettes and about a dozen Volkswagen Beetles. I was going to ask you how many Vets and Beetles that you have. I would say enough, but I don't think anybody has enough cars. That's what Barrett Jackson is all about, so people like me can buy more. Well, you guys were gracious enough to give me a tour of the facility when I was walking through, and you even have the Austin Powers Corvette in there, don't you? Well, that car was on loan to me. That was, you know, it's the only car that was on loan to me. I had the Corvette Summer Corvette, and we just thought the Austin Powers car would be great with it. And, you know, the movie cars, we just do not understand how impactful a famous car is in a movie. I could have have the neatest Corvette in the world, according to a Corvette person, but you put the Corvette summer car in there and everybody wants to see that car. It just has a mystique about it. Let's talk about some of the other cars you have in your museum. Oh, I've got uh, a lot of one-off Corvette styling cars, engineering cars. Recently, through Barrett Jackson, we bought Serve 4B, which was the uh, proof of concept vehicle for the C5. And this spring, from Barrett Jackson, I bought the Alpha and Beta C5 Corvettes. I have the last C5 Z06 and the last C4. And if you look at the Alpha and the Beta and the proof of concept vehicle, I've got some really, really significant cars. You know, the developmental cars, cars that are normally destroyed are unique and that they're all hand built and they were built years and years ahead of the production cars and they're work machines they're not beauties they're they're work machines to uh, get that design that platform put together and interesting when you look at them you just really realize how much work goes into building a car you know we see a car across the auction block and we think that they all start that way but they start on a piece of paper and they start as i would say crude and i don't mean crude as in no thought process but crude in the fit and finish of it as they tweak that car, use handmade parts to put it together, and the Alpha Corvette is just an absolutely stunningly hand-built car. I'll just be nice to it. But um, let me ask you this, in all the designers that, that uh, Corvette has had, are you a fan of Zora? Do you like Bill Mitchell? Who do you like? Well, I think from an engineering standpoint, you've, you've got to go with a uh, with Azura. He was there uh, early on, still holds a lot of patents in his family name and the trust name. And Azura was the guy that got stuff out the back door to uh, the race teams because he knew that that's really where the development went on and apart, the uh, reliability and the testing of it. And I think when you look at the design side, I guess I'm somewhat partial to John Caffaro, who styled the C5 Corvette, but that's because I know John personally, and he was there at the tail end of the C4 and into the C5, so that's a personal opinion of a friend versus, you know, is this an absolute critique from uh, an authority? No, it's a response of a friend. What do people that own Corvettes have in common? I think their passion for a high-performance front engine, rear-wheel drive vehicle. I think it's a passion for all things in American. I mean, if you, it's uh, to me, it's, it's American horsepower, it's sports car, and I think if you look at most of us when we got into Corvettes at, at uh, a younger age than we are today, it was that freedom, that that uh, self-expression. I mean, even today, I don't believe there's another car on the road that competes or compares with the Corvette. When you look at value for dollar, when you look at the total performance of the car, you look at the styling, reliability, quality. I mean, I can 
only fault the car maybe in one area, and I wouldn't even say that publicly. How's that, Mark? Pretty good. Name your three favorites if you could have them. How many kids you have? Oh, my gosh. I understand that. <laughs> See, I I ask people, Mark, when they ask that, and they go, well, I have three. And I said, which one is your favorite? And they go, quiet. I have had one person say, well, that's easy. That's my youngest. But right now, my favorite Corvette is XP819. It's a rear-engine Corvette that's being restored and is going to debut at Amelia Island, Florida in March. And with all the cars in my collection, I tend to get excited about the car that we're out promoting and showing. So uh, the Alpha and Beta cars, we will get a whole tag team with all their related pilot and pre-production cars. So they'll be my favorite. But right now with Amelia Island barely 60 days away, uh, XP definitely has my attention. Tell me the history. What year was that actually developed? Started in 1964. It was a engineering car looking at safety stuff like rack and pinion steering how the doors would open and allow a person to step out of the car it had a clamshell hood on it uh, that clamshell hood when you lift it up you could take it one detent passed open and lift it all off it was chevrolet's corvette's first attempt and frank winchell head of chevrolet engineering did this car and zora wasn't real happy with it because zora wanted to build the first rear engine corvette and frank winchell's team did it it had a cast iron v8 in it running in reverse like a marine engine and obviously a cast iron engine in the back of a car it gave it about a 60 40 uh, ratio of weight front to rear and on acceleration it would just lift the front end up and the car just has a lot of unique features on it like the accelerator and brake pedal were on a a seat track and we think it was out of a cadillac and you'd just push a button and they'd move up to you so the seat was fixed but the accelerator and pedal would move. Uh, it had a target top. Larry Shinoda did the styling, so when you look at the car, it's got the sail fins of a 68 Corvette on it. You overlay a 904 Porsche with it, and you go, wonder who was looking at whose cars, because those cars are real close to the same in looks. That's another name I forgot, Larry Shinoda. I mean, I've even seen pictures of his chopsticks special. He's got some amazing stuff. You know, I have a collection of all the... VI, what I call VIPs, a, a real significant autograph collection. I make a plaque when they come to Corvette Fun Fest and they sign it, and I put it in my garage museum. And I probably have 85 to 100 different what I consider people in the uh, auto industry that are important to the auto industry. And Larry's was the only one that I didn't get signed. And the night that Larry was going to sign it, he was not feeling well. And I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll get that done the next time. You know, I think that's a lesson you learn in life when you want to do something. Like you want to buy a car at Barrett Jackson, you buy it today because, you know, tomorrow may be too late. But, uh, you know, we do a Corvette Fun Fest event at Effingham. It's September 13th through the 16th this year. We'll have between 15 and 17,000 Corvettes there for the four-day weekend and about 45 to 50,000 people. And you know, you need to come out there and forget about coming to the museum. Come to Corvette Fun Fest. You know, you guys were nice enough to give me a uh, tour and also give me one of the booklets from Fun Fest. I had no idea it was that huge. It's just amazing. Well, that's like a lot of things that we started. They started off as just a small project in our first year and this will be our 19th year in 2012 we had 300 corvettes and about 1200 people and it was just a nice party now the numbers are just huge and i was talking to gary bennett a while ago about how many months they have to get here in advance to build this city at barrett jackson and it's it's a huge huge commitment in uh, man hours and dollars and just the physical goings on to build this place for this uh, week-long auction is pretty amazing We'll be right back with more Car Kicks. Just because your special vehicle was born with less than a perfect suspension doesn't mean it has to stay that way. You'll find the latest improvements in ride technology at Ride Tech. The road-hugging stance, the comfortable and responsive ride, the adjustable ride height and articulation. These are just a few of the reasons you want an air suspension. Follow the lead of professional installers across the country and count on Ride Tech for your complete air suspension solutions. With a Ride Tech suspension, you have a huge range of tunability for load capacity and spring rate right at your fingertips. No tools or component changes needed. You can literally compress 
compress weeks of tuning into a few minutes with a Ritec air suspension that's adjustable from within the car. Muscle cars, street rods, customs, trucks, even ATVs can benefit from Ritec's quality and innovation. Ritec's extensive research and development department keeps the company on the leading edge of automotive technology, resulting in complete systems and quality kits that are durable, reliable, and efficient. Get the handling your car deserves today at Ridetech.com. Find your nearby Ride Tech dealer at RideTech.com. The Black galleries are like no place you've ever experienced. Located an hour southeast of San Francisco in Danville, California, the Blackhawk encompasses nearly 70,000 square feet with four exhibition galleries, an automotive reference library, and a museum store, plus a special events area and meeting room. The Black Hawk is a Smithsonian affiliate museum open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Learn more about the Black Hawk at blackhawkmuseum.org. See you there. And now Mark Roman continues with Mike Yeager from Mid-America Motor Works. Well, speaking of your facility over there in the My Garage Museum, you were telling me that you're actually trying to build a test track behind there, aren't you? Well, we're now up to 210 acres, and I would like to get about another 150, and uh, we want to build a, a drag strip and a road course. And that, and I'm going to get some money when we're finished with this interview for me. I'll get a, okay. a few dollars from you to help me with my claws. But uh, we think it would be a great motorsports area, uh, central part of Illinois, close to Chicago, Indianapolis, and St. Louis. And that's really the, really the heart of a lot of activities in the car industry. I have the privilege of sitting here with Mike Yeager from Mid-American Motor Works. If you own a Corvette or if you know anything about Corvette, chances are you have one of his catalogs. Maybe you bought some parts and some other goodies from him. But, uh, Mike, I've got a Corvette, and I want to get it ready for Barrett-Jackson. How do I prep it? Well, I, the basics clean the car, but that's, you know, go way beyond cleaning the car. I think depending, I won't even say depending on the year, documentation is so important. Uh, window stickers, the older the car, the more paperwork work you have, historical photographs, any record of uh, past owners. I think a mistake that a lot of people make, Mark, is not staying with their car. There's so much excitement out here. It's hard to stay with your car when it's down in a, uh, a tent someplace because you want to go out and see everything else. But my advice is you got to got to keep a person there with the car you you gotta you know the car sells on the auction block when it goes up there when it comes off there's going to be a new owner and that's not the time to market the car the time to market the car is when it is today tomorrow the days before it goes on the block keep keep the car clean keep it accessible to people i hate a car that you're interested in buying and for some reason the owner's not there it's locked up and you can't see or ask any questions so you can touch it and feel it and yeah, you can see it, but you can't see it with its hood open, doors, you know, I mean, just really get out and experience, talk to the owner. Some owners have had the car short terms, others have had them a long term, know a lot about the car, but if you're going to get the maximum out of it, you've got to prep the car with the paperwork, you've got to be here and represent the car. I think you also look at the marketplace, how, how do you sell your car competitively, that some people think that they have to be up there on the Saturday night, but you know what, there's great prices on cars right now, both for the buyer and the seller, and I, I think if I were buying a car or selling a car, unless I had had a car out of my collection then I think I'd want it at prime time but uh, just you know just an average nice Corvette and that's hard to look at anybody and say your Corvette's just an average nice Corvette because to each owner it's their car and it's pretty important but I think I would I would choose to sell it somewhere during the course of this week the fans are here I mean there's tens and tens of thousands of people here but just represent your car can't think of much more than that mark I mean you just got to be there you got to be there as a willing seller because like I said when it hits the block whatever someone bids on it if you've not put some excitement into the car and some hype with it with the paperwork and knowledge of the car you're going to miss that all important buyer you know and one thing I wanted to mention too after uh, getting up on the block last night literally walked up on stage and all the all the talk this year is that there's some really nice cars coming through here early this year as opposed to Friday and Saturday well I mean Friday and Saturday these two days they can't sell every car I think there's over 1500 cars here and if you're a buyer or a seller you got to get here you just can't pick your date I mean you know what do they do maybe 12 cars an hour something like that I mean maybe there'd be 15 even if they were 20 do the math and you go man you you can't 
you can't get your car sold if you think Friday and Saturday are the prime days. I mean, there's buyers here every day of the week. And, you know, if you have the right car, you're going to get the right money. There's the other thing that sometimes people won't spend a few extra dollars to make their car right, whether it's a new new set of carpets or just a little extra money because when a buyer looks at something, and I think by and large there's a lot of buyers here at Barrett Jackson that want to buy a car ready to go, and that's ready to go in a museum, ready to go drive and enjoy. So the cars have got to be finished, a car that's half finished, so to speak, and not taken to that, you know, I, I would say Bloomington Gold level, but maybe that's too high of a level as far as the average Corvette that's out there selling. But uh, when you have the wrong stuff on a car, you know, even though people customize their Corvettes, they personalize them, selling, you're much better to have that car all stock. And I, I think that's a, you know, wrong colored cars, cars with the wrong wheels on them, those turn off the serious buyer. And if that serious buyer is not bidding on the car, the price doesn't bring what it should. When you have a right car and all you need are two serious buyers, uh, We've all seen the sky the limit out here. I was watching a 58 a couple of years ago, and the uh, critique side of me came out, and I said, well, that's a late model color, and it's got leather seat covers on it, and if I were buying a 58, I would want to buy an original car. A car crossed the block at $225,000, and there was two guys who wanted it, and kind of like a, a, a bird dog. They weren't going to let loose of that car till one of them got it, and it just went. I mean, if I I was a betting man I would have guessed maybe 75,000 nice nice car but when I look at it with a set of Corvette eyes and and that may be biased and the wrong set to look at I thought now oh, it'll be lucky to bring 75 and it went for two and a quarter yeah just the electricity and the energy of this place I mean money's no object but <laughs> but that's a good thing if you're a seller too it's a great thing if you're a seller now if you're a buyer but of course if you're a buyer and you're not paying attention or educating yourself and you know I think that whether you're buying Buying or selling, you read books, you read magazines, you go online and do some research. We would like to create a Corvette app. So, you know, all of us that carry our iPads around, just uh, Corvette app, and you just put in the serial number of the car, and you can get about the date it was built. And from there, the build date is important because you can say it's a numbers matching car. Well, the numbers may match, but they the right date code. In the Corvette world, the premium difference is cars with the right date codes, not only the right numbers. And, you know, what does the right numbers mean? To some people, it's like, does the serial number, the VIN number, and the engine number match? And go, what's a matching numbers car? But the Corvette world, the cars that bring the big dollars have the right date codes on the parts and more than likely they're an original car. Let's talk about matching numbers and the importance of it. Well, the importance number is, although you'd blow my theory apart on the 58 I was just speaking about that went for two and a quarter, but if, if you take two, let's just say 65, 396 red convertibles going across the block, one after the other, one could bring uh, 180, 190, and the next one could barely top $75,000. And you go, well, they were both good looking cars. What's the difference? And uh, non matching motors, uh, uh, wrong exhaust. I mean, just all the the wrong components with the right date code or wrong date codes. You could have a 396. Uh you know, maybe too early of a, an intake manifold or, you know, whatever whatever a person really looks for and says, well, it is what it is. It's a 65 396 convertible, but there was parts on it that couldn't have come with the car because the date code was before a car was built. And the buyers that are going to pay that 180 to 200,000 for a car, by and large, there's always that anomaly, but by and large, that, that buyer is going to know the right car from a bogus car. Excellent. We are sitting here with Mike Yeager of Mid-American Motor Works, and if you've got a catalog that's sitting out in your garage, you know exactly what I'm talking about if you're a Corvette fanatic. Mike, tell me how that catalog came to be. Well, Mark, right now we mail about four and a half million of the Corvette catalog in a year's time. It started off as a single sheet of paper in 1974, and it's grown up to about 320 pages plus a full website, mamotorworks.com, that has more parts on it than our catalog does. We can't 
put them all in the catalog. We have virtually every part. We're, we're weak on the 53 to 55 stuff, but you start from 56 up to the current car, and there's there's probably not a part that we don't have available to us, and we can't inventory every part. Although years ago, when I was much more, it was a much smaller business, I knew every part that we had. And today, people say, do you have a return throttle spring for a uh, 390 horse 67 Corvette? And I go, I don't know. I guess we do. Currently in our Corvette catalog, we have over 80,000 parts. And my mind just isn't big enough to wrap around those 80,000 parts. But uh, with, with the advent to really focus in on the right parts, I mean, I, I, 80,000 parts is just a number that we hit. When, but when you look at, at uh, rights and lefts and colors, that number gets real big real quick. Well, if you think about it, you've pretty much single-handedly made it really easy to restore a Corvette. I mean, there's some cars that it's really hard to find parts for, but you've pretty much put it into a Bible, haven't you? Well, we do have a Bible, Mike Yeager's Corvette Bible, but really that book was was written covering 53 to 2011. We need to update it now, but we really did that book to address that novice first-time buyer that, you know, I hate to see people buy the wrong car. I really do. And trying to give them tips of what to look for or if they buy a car that's not a perfect car, what's all right to do with it? And I think that if it's your car, anything you want to do is all right with it. But if you buy an old clapped out 69 Corvette and you get digging around on the car and you find out that originally it was an L88, the car should be restored. If you buy a 69 Corvette and you find out it was a base engine car and been hit a couple times, fix it up the way you want it. That's okay too. What I don't like to see is people get too much money invested in a car and now they're literally and figuratively upside down value-wise in the car. And value isn't the only reason you buy a Corvette. There's a lot of other reasons, but it's certainly one of motivating reasons that you buy the right car at the right price and put the right amount of money in it. You're going to enjoy it. Should the time come that you want to get rid of the car, you'll go, boy, I was pretty smart buying that car. And addressing the, the you know, we're sitting here at Barrett-Jackson talking about Corvettes and as they go across the block. The other adage, Mark, is that you never pay too much for a car. Sometimes you just buy it too early. So you have to spend a little bit of time uh, waiting for that car to come up in value. And I think that's what I'm seeing in these uh, C3 Corvettes that are coming through here. They're bringing nice prices, but that is the next logical car to really catch on. I mean, the 82 Corvette's 30 years old. And typically in that 25 to 30 year age range is when most cars start having that quote patina. They start looking good. I, I'm hoping that's a trend that we see because we have a lot of customers with that C3 Carvette. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, if the young bloods actually grab onto the uh, the new vets as well too. Oh, I think they will. I, I think that you know when the C5 Corvette was introduced, that it had as much pizzazz around it as a 63 Stingray. And when I look at what people did to the 63 Stingray when it came out, they did the same thing to that 97, 98, that whole C5 generation Corvette. So, see, in our business, we want to sell them all the parts, all the aftermarket parts, and then when the car gets old, we get to sell them all the original parts back to restore the car. So we, we kind of catch them coming and going. Give me your website. It's www.mamotorworks.com. And we are launching two new websites March 1st. So hopefully I won't have to eat my words. We will get them launched March 1st. Be much more comprehensive with a lot more content, detail, technical information down to the SKU level. So I'm really excited about that. It's been two years in the making and I'm really ready to uh, launch this puppy. Well, if you do get a chance, you've got to go see the, uh, the mecca that it is in Effingham, Illinois. It's real easy to find off of I-70 if you're traveling cross-country. I stumbled across it so anybody can find it. Mike Yeager of Mid-America Motor Works. I am, it's an honor and privilege just to sit here and talk to you. Thank you so much. Well, Mark, it goes both ways. And, you know, we do have our museum marked literally and figuratively with you, Mark. 
I was aware that this one yardstick from 1963, and that'll go with my 63Z06, came from you. And I discovered that when we met moments ago. So I'd like to take this chance in front of your audience to say not only thank you for the time here on the air, but thank you for the yardstick, sir. Actually, I was passing through and I had found something from 1963 from AZ Chevrolet back in uh, Penny Hills near Pittsburgh. And it was in brand new shape and I had an extra one and it's on the wall now in Mid-America. But uh, Mike, thanks for the time. Thanks to Mark and Mike for sharing their time at Barrett Jackson or Car Kicks in just a moment. Car Kicks will be right back. Haggerty provides specialty insurance for more classic cars than anyone else in the world. They specialize in classic and collector cars. Since that's all they do, they're able to focus all their attention on you, your collection, and your particular needs, your usage, your interests. They offer a guaranteed value policy that allows you to cover your car for what it's worth, and you receive every cent of your car's insured value in the event of a covered total loss. Haggerty's service and knowledge are unparalleled. They understand the collector car market and the importance of insuring your car for its true value. And they know how to handle claims on damage to your classic cars. For example, they have a part specialist on staff whose only job is to track down the perfect replacement part. Haggerty is made up of people who own collector vehicles, closely follow the market, and know the history of the auto industry. They've experienced the joys and challenges of restoration and attend every car event they can get to. Contact Haggerty Insurance today and see the difference on the web at Haggerty.com or call 877-922-9701. Tell them you heard about them on carkicks.com. It's the Car Kicks Car Cap, a great ball cap for just $10. You can be a part of the ruling elite with your Car Kicks Car Cap. Stop being laughed at by your mom. Get the hat. Just 10 bucks plus tax and handling, and an agent of a semi-governmental agency will deliver it to wherever you get your U.S. mail. Get the Car Kicks Car Cap today at carkicks.com. That's K-A-R-K-I-X.com. Now, here's Bob Lang. Wanting to make this a really special presentation for you, I thought it would be appropriate if we could actually hear and feel a real live Corvette. We've talked a lot about the history and the restoration, but we hadn't really talked about the new Corvette. So I thought a a trip out to one of the dealers that I do voice for on their commercials would be a good idea. And maybe we could take a vet around the block and see how it really is to be in the driver's seat. Got a hold of my friends over at one of the Southwest premier Chevrolet dealers, Brad Francis Chevrolet. You can uh, check them out at bradfrancis.com. And a gentleman by the name of Dylan Hill. Dylan is a certified Corvette expert. He is a second generation uh, Chevrolet salesman. So we had somebody on hand to really give us a tour of the Chevy 100th anniversary Corvette that they had in stock there. Dylan, tell us about this Corvette. And this is our 2012 Chevrolet Corvette 100 year anniversary. Here we have our LS3 6.2 liter 436 horsepower engine, 427 foot pounds of torque. Now with amazing power, it also gets an amazing 16 to 18 miles per gallon in the city and a 26 to 28 miles per gallon on the highway. Do you hear that greenies? I want you to all run out in a buying frenzy and get a Corvette. Yes, they are great cars. They are America's one of America's best-selling sports cars out there, and they also hold their value, like I had said before. This really is America's supercar, and uh, you can tell by the performance numbers as well as the fit and finish. As we look around the car, you'll see an incredible attention to detail. Also, another couple of the great features that the Chevy Corvette offers are the braking system with the Brembo brakes to allow you to brake at sudden stops when you need to on a high-performance machine. It also has a heads-up display that allows you not to take your eyes off the road. It projects the screen up onto the windshield. It actually tells you how fast you're going, your 0 to 60 time, and how many Gs you're pulling when you turn. So it's got a G-meter built into it as well as, the, as, well as all the other heads-up information. Yes, sir, it does. That's pretty handy. <laughs> you can see the 100-year anniversary emblem is a lot different from the original Corvette emblem. It comes in a cyber gray metallic. Okay. Let's see, as we come along to the side, you can see we have our vent open, and that actually allows the air to get down to the brakes. That way it cools it down when you're doing your high-performance driving. As you come around on the inside, you can see the amazing setup of the 2012 Chevrolet Corvette 100-year anniversary. You have what's called a six-speed paddle shifter when it comes in a a six-speed automatic, and also you've got what's called launch control. Now, if you see right there, you've got two modes you can select from, from a touring and a sport mode. Basically what you can do is you put it in sport mode, you want to get handy, you want to take a long cross road um, country trip with your wife, put it in touring. 
tell me a little bit more. Uh, launch control. What exactly does it do? I mean, does it hold the brake for you? Does it? Does it? Launch control. Basically, what it does, it Go modifies ahead. the RPMs to lay the power down more smoothly. So it adjusts the RPMs. Nice. Okay. And as we come around, you still you can see that you still have the two lights in the back, which of course is uh, Chevy's trademark for the Corvettes. You've actually got what's called a dual exhaust system mode. Okay, basically when you get to a certain RPMs, it's going to open up two other pipes for better for better airflow and maximum power. So it starts with two and goes to four. Yes, that's correct. Also, the 2012 Corvette 100-year anniversary comes standard with your uh, heated seats, your navigation DVD, and your OnStar. Somebody can find a way to steal this amazing vehicle. OnStar will locate the vehicle and shut it down. Now that's handy. Yes, it is. In Very today's handy. world, have it, being able to pick up a phone and go, shut off my car <laughs> and stop the thief is a pretty good deal. Yes. And as you can also see on the brakes, you can see that they're cross-drilled holes to maximize the airflow and keep the brakes nice and cool. Also, the 2012 Corvette is high-powered machine as it is. It comes standard with the Eagle F1 Goodyear Edition type. Order your new Corvette today through bradfrancis.com. Okay, Dylan, let's take this thing out for a run. Special thanks to Brad Francis and the team at Brad Francis Chevrolet, including sales manager Damon Sumner and Dylan Hill, for uh, letting us play with their 100th anniversary of Chevrolet Corvette Special Edition. A wonderful, wonderful vehicle. You can buy this car if you, if you have a mind to. Just get a hold of them at bradfrancis.com. They'll be glad to get you behind the wheel. Beautiful automobile. And you can see photos of it on our Facebook page at the Car Kicks Facebook page and at carkicks.com. More Car Kicks in just a moment. Time for a look in the Car Kicks Toolbox. In the toolbox today, a trio of handy tools for working on any car, truck, or bike. Gunk Engine Products. Gunk originally started as a degreaser called Engine Bright. As the story goes, the developer of Engine Bright was a rider, a motorcycle enthusiast, who was asked by a fellow rider to give me some of that gunk to get the grease off my bike or something to that effect. From then on, the product was referred to as Gunk. And for more than 50 years, Gunk has been a most trusted name in cleaning and degreasing and has provided, well, uh, solutions to tackle the toughest grease, grime, and gunk throughout the garage. If you haven't done an engine cleaning in a while, or if you've never done one, you might wonder why do it at all. Well, it's good to clean off built up oil and grease from areas around your engine that could cause heat spots. They have the potential to reduce the life and efficiency of your engine. And that's your expensive, gee, I could have bought a hot tub instead of replacing my engine engine we're talking about. A few bucks for a can of gunk could help you spot trouble before it gets serious. This is especially important for the cars we don't necessarily hold in as high esteem as our fun mobiles, you know, our daily drivers. They need some love, too. If you clean its engine with foamy engine cleaner after each winter, you'll keep your engine free from salt and debris that can cause corrosion on vital engine parts. You know the parts, the ones that make you say the parts counter, that little part is how much? After a degrease of your new barn find, you can use Gunk Foamy Engine Cleaner. It's specifically formulated to remove heavy dirt and road grime from cars, trucks, campers, RVs, ATVs, boat engines, and your power equipment, too. I have seen some funky air compressors in garages don't don't let friends and family see that stuff you know the feeling you get when you walk into a clean shop well it's the same looking under the hood gunk engine protector is an engine detailer and protector that you follow up with it leaves your engine with a protective layer of shine and that's the way you want your gear to look the outside can look like a star but if you don't finish the job under the hood it's like opening a cookie jar and finding something other than cookies in there Get your toolbox together with Gunk Degreaser, Foamy Engine Cleaner, and Gunk Engine Protector. And that's today's Car Kicks Toolbox. Now, here's the host of Car Kicks, Bob Lang. The 1963 Corvette is one of the most stylish cars ever made anywhere. Bill Mitchell and Larry Shinoda designed a high waistline, sleek, chiseled car called the Stingray, while Zora Arcus Duntop was passionately building a chassis worthy of the design. The result of this hat trick of automotive magicians was the 1963 Corvette Stingray. A new fastback coupe with a split back window and a roadster with its own beauty. Smooth, bold form lines and rotating headlights piled on a beautiful new chassis. 
the Roadster would make people notice this incredible design, but the Fastback Coupe would make them stop in their tracks and stare. It changed the whole perspective of what was possible. The public took a little more than 10,000 coupes and a little more than 10,000 Roadsters home. Corvette sales were surely getting noticed upstairs at GM. In 64 and 65, the Corvette lost the split window but gained a 375 horsepower fuel injected 327 V8. But the big blocks that came in 65 pushed the fuely 327 aside. The L78, or 396 as it was known on the street, put out 425 horsepower. Then in 66, the 427 LS72 put out 425 but more civilized horsepower. The 327 4 barrel grew in power too, in various versions from 300 to the now near holy 350 horsepower version. Then in 67, the L88 claimed the top of the hill with a 430 horsepower rating. The most opinions run around 500 because of the way ratings ran. It added so much to the price and was so focused on racing with its radio delete and heater delete that only 20 were built. Corvette was from the base model to the L88 the top of millions of boys and a few girls wish lists. But the newsstands of the day started to show drawings of a futuristic sports car, something called the Mako Shark. It kind of looked like a stingray and a shark going together in a magical world of sports cars. Larry Shinoda's Mako Shark 2 show car was displayed in 1965 and became the basis of the 1968-80 Corvette. Besides that shark-like exterior, the new Corvette had T-tops that could convert the coupe to an open-air car in just moments. The low, wide appearance was a hit, although first-year quality was horrible, and improved the second season of the C3. It would ring the performance bell with the ZL1 SuperVet. Motor Trend raved, and even though most Corvettes would not be endowed with 500-plus horsepower, the badge of performance for the C3 was etched for a generation. With the coming of strict emission controls in 71, the party was over. Oh man, way, way over. At least for a dozen years or so, low compression and detuning became the norm. These were the dark ages. By the time my moment in life to buy a new Corvette came, the 350 made just 180 horsepower. That sniffing distance to the original Blue Flame 6. Sad days for performance enthusiasts. Comfort was up and performance went down, chrome was gone, and rubber bumpers were in. And despite complaints about quality, and there are plenty, there are C3s with hundreds of thousands of miles on them. The chrome all disappeared in 73, the convertible disappeared in 76, as did the last drop of power. 1978 brought the return of the back glass house and the anniversary and pace car editions. 79 and 80 saw the struggle to regain horsepower with 190 or 230 horsepower versions. In June of 81, production moved to Bowling Green, Kentucky from St. Louis, and 82 saw the end of the manual transmission. To quote B.B. King, the thrill was gone, and so was the Corvette. For 1983, there were only 43 pre-production Corvettes produced, only one still exists, and none of them ever made it into public hands. Engineers had their work cut out for them. If they wanted to bring back the magic, in 1984, the C4 had to take a swing for the fences. In the beginning, all you could get was the automatic, and later in the year, a four-speed with three overdrives on top of three gears. It was not a very critically acclaimed transmission. A stiff ride and still only 205 horsepower left the fans wanting more. At least the chassis would provide a foundation for more improvements coming. The 85, 86, and 87 models saw the addition of tuned port injection anti-lock brakes, and more bumps in horsepower. For 1989, Corvette got a nanny manual. It would force a skip from first to fourth under park throttle conditions for better mileage. In 1990, Corvette was going to get up off its knees and bring the ZR1 to market. It had all the right numbers except one. The top speed was 175, the horsepower was 375, and the 0 to 60 was a happy 4.7 seconds. But the near $60,000 price tag was close to double the regular vet's price. The price-conscious Corvette owner was still getting by with 250 horsepower. The comfort, safety, and ergonomics were getting better with the new dash, ventilation, and sound system. And for 92, the stock engine got back to 300 horsepower. And in the 93ZR, it brought power back to over 400. By 96, a number of improvements in collector editions, like the Grand Sport, appeared. But that's as far as the C4 went.
The C5 edition that runs from 1997 to 2004 may just be my favorite Corvette. It seemed to me to be the first no-excuses vet in many, many years. Everything changed. You could still see the lineage, the heritage of the Corvette, but this was the high-tech world beater with the hydroformed frame and 345 horsepower in base trim. Motor Trend glowed about the value, capability, comfort, and automotive hat trick. How could they top the 97? By bringing back a convertible in 98. Convertible with a trunk, it would be the pace car again and could at least hang out with the crowd. In some ways, this new breed of Corvette was better than a Ferrari in getting to 60. It was well-rounded, a world-class competitor, with a price well below its peers. The addition of a fixed-roof coupe, a lighter weight model, would become the platform for the Z06 in 2001. It came with 385 horsepower and outdid the ZR1 for less money. 2002 brought more power and Electron Blue paint. I gotta tell you, I like that. The 50th anniversary model, the 03, was a deep red and introduced the new magnetic ride system. It used electric current to adjust shock absorber performance in less than the blink of an eye. This is the system that migrated to the current Cadillac CTSV and was adapted by Ferrari and other makes in recent years. C5 racing efforts were very successful and helped fly yellow become a popular color. The C6 is the current Corvette, but it's nearing the end of its cycle. The goal of the C6 was to do more things well than its upmarket peers. Well, the value meter is pegged on the happy side. You can see the hints of Corvette heritage all over the smaller, lighter C6. Now it has one engine, the 6-liter LS2, with 4.2 seconds to 60 and 186 mile an hour top speed. And it got the Z51 package. Now to me, the C6 is smaller inside, or at least it feels that way. Maybe with age, I've just gotten bigger outside. But the quality and fit of the new car is a vast improvement over previous generations. It's modern, it's fast, it's well-engineered, and all freaking American style. The Corvette team has brought the Corvette back to the top. So what's next for the Corvette? 2013 models will be an evolution, but coming in 2014 is the next Corvette. The pre-production mules are running around the undisclosed locations wearing black baggy clothes, but a slightly longer wheelbase is a guess from the spy photos. The reports also say the rear deck seems a little higher, but the baggy clothes could hide that. The front opening appears to be narrower and a little taller. GM says it will look more European. <laughs> I hope not. I like it American, thank you. There'll be no split window like the concept car. Bob Lutz says it will be a bolder design, more dramatic, and something that ignites the younger generation, like the 60s and 70s models did. That sounds American to me, so I'm good with it. He also said it will be better in performance, including fuel economy. Frankly, I don't care. The folks at Chevrolet are so focused on making the Corvette successful, it's bound to be fun. Happy 100th, Chevy. We're looking forward to the Corvette birthday party next year. Till next time, see you at carkicks.com. Are you in an automotive-related industry? If you'd like to advertise on Car Kicks, we offer social media, web, and on-air opportunities to automotive-based businesses that want to be heard by this very special audience. People who take action and get things done. Auto enthusiasts with the means to use products and services provided by quality companies. We have special programming that gives you the opportunity to get your message out with more than just a 60-second ad. To find out more, use the contact page at carkicks.com. The Blackhawk Automotive Galleries are like no place you've ever experienced. Located an hour southeast of San Francisco in Danville, California, the Blackhawk encompasses nearly 70,000 square feet with four exhibition galleries, an automotive reference library, and a museum store, plus a special events area and meeting room. The Black Hawk is a Smithsonian Affiliate Museum, open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Learn more about the Black Hawk at blackhawkmuseum.org. See you there! I hope you enjoyed the Corvette special. When you consider the number of things that have to happen to get a car made, it's incredible we have cars like Corvette, Viper, Shelby's. People driven by passion brought these gems into reality. If you saw the Super Bowl ad for the new Acura NSX, the new Jaguars and others that are continuing to raise the bar, we really have some incredible car choices. Now, I confess I can't afford a $445,000 Lambo just yet, which makes the Camaro, Mustang, Challenger, and yes, the Corvette such a bargain, respectively, of course. 
Lots of performance for not much money. With 435 horsepower and 26 miles per gallon highway, that is some engineering savvy by Chevrolet right there. Ford, too. They have their base Mustang with 300 horsepower and 31 miles per gallon for under 20000 That's why I call this the golden age of cars. There's something more about them, though. It's not the price. It's the sound and the feel and the look. These are distinctively American cars. Sure, some parts come from overseas, but the style and the sound is distinctly American. It's a sound and a feeling that connect with a land full of possibilities. The mindset was that you had to be European to compete at Le Mans. You had to be Japanese to make reliable quality. Americans love those types of challenges and have overcome them with regularity. I mean, you could go to eBay and sort mileage under your favorite American make and see the changes in longevity over the last decade. Many people are too young to remember when people thought a car with 75,000 miles was way past its expiration. I know one former co-worker with a C3 vet with over 300,000 miles on the clock, and it looks good too. The Corvette competes on the world stage now, successfully, and as long as the suits at GM will build it, the faithful will continue to expand its reach. Next year, we'll bring you the details on the return of the 427 Convertible Corvette, the 60th anniversary model. Till then, see you on Facebook and at KARKIX.com. That's all for now. See you right here next time with more Car Kicks. Car Kicks is a production of Spirited USA, who is solely responsible for its content. Copyright 2011. All rights reserved. Join us on the web at carkicks.com. That's K-A-R-K-I-X.com. And on Facebook and Twitter. Hasta la vista, baby. Ciao. You're free to go on your own recognizance. See you later. Bye-bye.